then he's replaced by, obviously, he has appointed his successor. And it's uh, in the standard Islamic narrative, they call him Uthman. Now, in, in the history, we don't know who he is. But what we, what we do know is that he did send, uh, um, he did send uh, emissaries uh, to, to China. And they also give us this little reference to the Tang Chinese record. It's in 651, it says the emissaries of the king of King Tashik, which in Persian would be Tazig. Tashik is, is, is the old Chinese pronunciation of Dashi. Dashi in modern Chinese in, in, this, in the Tang Chinese pronunciation was Tashik, which is again Tajikistan, which Sebios is using. So it's the same, we know it's the same person, the same kingdom. They call him, they say the king's name, well, they say his name is Tashik. Now the standard Islamic sources, uh, standard Islamic narrative calls him Uthman, but this source is calling him Tashik. Um, and uh, we know from the standard Islamic narrative, they say that he's the one who assembles the Quran. We don't know if that's true. What we do know is that the earliest Quranic materials begin to appear at this time. Like, for example, the Birmingham manuscript, they begin to appear at this time. And what we also know is that uh, the contemporary with him, this king, is somebody called Pope Martin, the Roman, uh, the Roman Pope Martin or the Patriarch of uh, Rome, the Bishop of, Bishop of Rome, Martin, is arrested by the Byzantines at this time. And he's charged with collaboration with the Saracens because they say that he was involved in, in approving or granting them their tome. Tome is a book, a book, book, and there's only one book of the Saracens at this time, and that's the, what we know is the Quranic material. So, so there is reference to a book emerging at this time under this king's reign um, and uh, that book though is somehow in the hands of uh, of Pope Martin who is arrested by the Byzantines by the way just so you know the Byzantines are in heresy at this point they're following the Nestorian uh, religion uh, under the name uh, monothelitism and uh, Pope Martin rejected the idea of monothelitism and uh, he was so he wasn't they weren't keen on him. The Byzantines were not keen on him. They wanted to get rid of him. But they, um, they accused him of having collaborated with the Saracens on this tome, on this book, and uh, he denied it, but they found him guilty. The evidence was against him. We don't know the full details, but the evidence was against him. So they sentenced him to death. Now, the interesting thing is that this King Tashik, I suppose this corresponding with the uh, standard Islamic narrative, Othman then launches the uh, Battle of Masts, the invasion of the Mediterranean um, against the Byzantines. And interestingly, this invasion stops as soon as the Byzantines change the sentence. They, they, they change the sentence of Pope Martin from death, because they sentenced him to death, and they re-sentence re him to exile. They, they, they change the sentence to exile instead. At this point, the invasion of the Mediterranean stops and uh, they, things calm down between the Byzantines and the Arabs at this time. But then, um, not long after this, this king is assassinated too. This uh, Uthman is assassinated too. Now, I would suggest that he was assassinated again because if he's sending a book uh, for approval from the Pope, for example, if the Pope has got a copy, if he sent a copy to the Pope and says, here, here's a, here's a copy of our book, what do you think? Uh, and so the Byzantines are using this as some kind of um, proof that he's collaborating with the Saracens because there's some kind of correspondence like that going between them. It's, it's, and although the Pope denied uh, anything to do with it, it's likely that the, the, the leader considered himself close enough in religion to the Pope to consider the Pope as the one who should be getting a copy of this I mean, why didn't he send a copy of this book to the Tang Chinese, for example? We have this record of the Tang Chinese from the Ju Tang Shu saying that the king sent the emissaries there, but there's no reference to a book. Yet, we have a reference also to the arrest and sentence of Pope Martin for collaboration with the Saracens. And there's a clear reference to the, the, the problem being the book. That's, the, that's what it's all about. So there's some kind of basis to this. And I've already said before, when I've spoken to you before, that I have this challenge going, I can, I can interpret every verse of the Quran 
from a monophysite Christian point of view. Even if you think it's against Christianity, I can prove that actually it's all pro-Christianity from the monophysite point of view. And it's probably that he was um, um, promoting um, or he's trying to um, get a comment on his monophysite Christianity because the Pope, he had probably heard that the Pope was against the Byzantines. The Byzantines were oh, angry just, about just so, people, just so yeah. people understand what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah. You're saying every verse, even the ones referring to all the, uh, all the re references to like chapter 33 that refer to the story about the wives of, uh, of this emissary of, of this representative of God or the prophet of God. I can, Those I, can interpret it, I can interpret it all. It's just you need to, you know, first of all, you need to forget everything you've learned in English. And secondly, you need to throw away all of the Haraka and the diacritical markings. Okay. Then okay. you're left with a very bare, bare, bare skeleton text. And with that text, that's the text, that's the original Quranic, the Quranic, the original okay. Quranic materials you're looking at. Yeah. And with that text, everything, everything can be interpreted from an entirely monophysite Christian point of view. Even, but, but it's, it's not mono, it's not a uh, standard Orthodox Oriental Orthodox Church monophysitism. It's, it is that same monophysite uh, Christology, but it is actually Messianic Hebrew uh, interpretation. Let me just, before you get into that, are you suggest, would you agree then with Christoph Luxemburg and, and Gunther Luling that all of the Quran, if you go back to the Syro Aramaic, can be understood? As coming from this Christian monophysite background. Yes, and Peter von Sievers too. This is actually from, um, uh, I mean, these are great names we just named here. These are real scholars. And I actually tried, the reason I got into this is because when I first read that uh, the claim by Christoph Luxemburg in, in, in the two, in year 2000, I thought that was insane. And I, I actually set out to try and prove him wrong. But when I, and when I Every single verse that I got at, you know, you have to try it, see if you have to disprove your hypothesis, right? Every verse I got at, I could give an interpretation from a monophysite Christian point of view. So it works. Even the verses where you think you might be saying, that's the book, yes. Even the verses where you think it's like, but it says, no, it clearly says Jesus wasn't crucified. No, it doesn't say that. In this book. I can't see it. A challenge, you... a challenge to Islam for Reformation. Who is it by? Gunther Luling. Ah, right. Dr. Gunther Luling is the one that actually uh, went back to the, uh, the Syriac and has showed that almost all of the verses in the Quran, all the poetry in the Quran can be traced back to, in this case, monophysite Christian hymns yes. that were written in the 5th and 6th century. Yes. And he did it strophe by strophe by strophe. Now, I know... Gunther Loding, personally, I've been in his home. I was the one that actually got this book and had it translated from German into English and then had it published so that people Wonderful. can read it. You can well, get it on Amazon. Another one to add to the curriculum. You know, we should actually have a curriculum with, <laughs> we should start a reading list and have a curriculum so that people can follow this. Because uh, I have Jewish books, which I can also recommend, even going way back to the 1800s, where um, Basically, what I'm introducing you to is, is essentially sort of a, a Jewish perspective, which was taking a long time to, to filter through to the, to the non-Jewish world. Uh, so he gets assassinated too. And it's, 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 it's probably, again, because the Sadducees are not happy with this, uh, this Christian book and this, these two Christian leaders. The last leader converted uh, to Christianity almost on his deathbed, you know, practically in the last few years. And um, this leader was promoting a new, a new, a new religious book or new Christianity, I suppose, for the Sadducees. It was a kind of a messianic Hebrew version, but they didn't like that. So they assassinated him. And then what happens? Well, we, we don't know very well, but that what we do know is that we have this Muawiyah establishing himself in, um, the, in this, in this, in Syria. And he definitely does not like Christians at first, but then his daughter gets possessed by a, uh, a demon and they invite a, a Christian priest to exercise her. He exercises her and then he seems to convert to Christianity too. Um, in the East, we have even less knowledge of what goes on, but we do know they, they can't hide that there was some big giant fitna conflict going on between the East and the West. They're fighting each other at this point. 
And I think that that conflict is basically a conflict between um, between mess Messianic Hebrews and Sadducees. And I think what we see at the end with, um, with Abdul Malik is that he tries to sort of establish the balance. I think the Monophysite Christian Hebrews were based in the East. Um, I think that when Muawiyah finally converted, there was a period of peace um, until... Uh, Muawiyah converts because of his daughter, because she is healed by a Christian. Yes, You're, that's the, that's the story. Is... Yes, because uh, in the end, I, I believe they say that he starts praying uh, in the Church of the Domitian, which is, of course, where uh, Mary is supposed to be buried. Um, so that is... Uh, um, uh, that's a big sign <laughs> that he's converted, I think. So, um, so there seem to be uh, like periods of 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 conflict when they are um, uh, not messianic, and then they seem to be at peace when they're messianic, and then they be at conflict again when they're not messianic, and then they're at peace again. So it's like the, the messianics are getting suppressed, and then gradually somebody converts, and then there's peace until the next revolution, and it, it goes back and forth like that until. Um, I think Abdul Malik sort of comes out on top. I'm going to say that I believe Abdul Malik and the Umayyad religion is actually Messianic Hebrew religion, and I don't believe it's Islamic, and I don't believe that um, Abdul Malik is actually trying to speak out against Christianity with the Dome of the Rock. I believe that those passages in, on the Dome of the Rock reference to Muhammad are references to Jesus. But I think that he's promoting a monophysite view of Jesus uh, in that Dome of the Rock, and he's he's trying to enforce that view. So I think it, it gradually we had a kind of a messianic uh, Hebrew religion happen. So what happened is that the Qibla then changes. This explains the Qibla because when everybody is in uh, following the Sadducee religion, they're all basically having synagogues, and every synagogue always faces the Holy Land. So it looks like it's facing towards Petra, but in reality they're facing towards the the Holy Land in general, and they're not very precise. I've looked at the evidence of Dan Gibson, they're not very precise. They don't go 100% to Petra, it's, it's not true. I've looked at the lines, they go roughly to the Holy Land and they're all kind of converging around the sort of the Jordan Valley and a few in Jerusalem, a few in Petra, but they're, they're not very clear. But that's natural because that's where the synagogues are all facing. But then the Quran says, um, turn your face to the Masjid al-Haram, and al-haram in this case refers to, it's just another word for Jesus. You see, if you have the, the Messianic and Hebrew interpretation of the Quran, suddenly the Quran becomes full of references to Jesus. It's like Jesus again, Jesus again, Jesus again. But he has many different titles, at-tariq, uh, al-haram, Muhammad. They have so many different titles for Jesus, but the Quran is all entirely basically about Jesus. Um, and so al-masjid al-haram is basically, for example, it says, we have seen you turning your face towards the heavens and now we will appoint for you a, a qibla that your heart will be satisfied with. So wherever you are, turn your face towards al-masjid al-haram. This means don't face Jerusalem anymore. Turn your face towards wherever you worship Christ. So every church. And that's where, where, you, where you have this suddenly period where all the Qiblas suddenly go chaotic facing every direction. It's like, well, they're facing south, they're facing to North Hijaz, they're facing, they're facing all over the direction. And then the rise of the Abbasids, they start to all face towards Mecca. Mecca. So at first, all of them are facing towards Jerusalem because they're all Jews. They're all, mess they're all Sadducees and they're all facing Jerusalem. Then they get converted to Christianity and they don't care what direction they face. They face any direction they like because God is wherever you turn your face. So the masters are facing all over the place. And then it's standardized, it's standardized as the, the, the rise of the Abbasids. Because the Abbasids don't just suddenly come into power from nowhere. There is a party of Abbasids getting more and more powerful. And they, they, they probably herald from um, uh, the Hijaz because the Abbasids want to focus everything on the Hijaz. They're probably from the Quraysh, uh, and, and so they, they, they reconstruct the story to big up their own family and how important they are. So they make everything face towards the Hijaz, and that's, you know, Islam comes out of that. But they, they have to work with what they've got. They can't abolish what they've got. It's already spread too far. So it's basically a kind of a mixture of Zoroastrianism and Christianity and uh, Judaism. And mix it all together, and there you've got Abbasid Islam. 
<laughs> but that's not how it began. It began as a Sadducee religion. The Sadducees started converting to Messianic Hebrew belief. Uh, and then the, uh, the Abbasids started to rise in power until they took control. So that's the view I have. And I know that people are going to be like shocked and saying, what? <laughs> <laughs> but I can explain. Look, I've been studying this since the 1990s, same as you. And I, 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 I know that you used to also believe that Jerusalem was the point back in the year 2000. I know that, yes, because we're that old. <laughs> so we've been, we've been through this a long time. How old are you? I don't want to. I don't want to say on, on, on because because are you as old as me? Old. I'm 67. I'm not that old, no. But okay. uh, I was I was reading you. But <laughs> I was reading you back in 2000. So well, listen, uh, Joe. So, this has been excellent. I we won't. You know, we've gone a long time. This is we're coming up yeah. on. So I, I think we'll. Uh, I might have to cut some parts out in that. This, so by the time I edit it out. Uh, not not what you're saying, but because of the maps and everything else and everything that I need to put yeah. in, it may come to about an hour between an hour and a half and two hours. It, it, you are going to get some feedback on this, Joe. I won't I'm, respond in the comments because there is there is like a, a a twenty minute video behind each point, so I'll just leave it like that. If you want me to respond to each point, I'm happy to come back and do a thousand twenty minute comment. Video what we could do? This let's do this. Let's do time. this, Joe. And now I'm talking to everybody that's watching this. People. Mm -hmm. Joe has brought out an awful lot of material, all in goodness sakes, with in just an hour and a half. Brilliant stuff. Thanks so much, Joe. Uh, you're one of a kind to be able to do that. And you're bringing in a whole other spectrum into the narrative. And that is, have we looked at the Jewish antecedents? We need to go back to the Jewish antecedents, which figure into an awful lot of this, especially the Sadducee, the whole, this very literalistic, very radical form of Judaism that was very strong up there in the East. And they are the ones that were, they are the ones that this Umar comes out of. And it's this Omar that we're all looking at lately. And this is what we've yeah. been looking at. Peter has brought this, I'm sorry, Paul has brought this up. Mel has brought this up. Uh, good old Odon La Lafontaine has brought this up. Joe is bringing this up. And we're seeing to think that it is this Omar that uh, Leo Levand, not Leo, but sorry, that uh, Thomas the Presbyter is talking about, that the doctrine of Iacobi from 634, that Sabaeus is talking about, the Chronicles of Sabaeus. They all seem to be referring to this guy named Omar, who could be Amar, who could be Ambrose, uh, who could be also Mahmet, because they, this is the name that he has given. Now, yeah. if that is the case, we need to try to piece together, and this is what we have said, always, always, always piece together from the material that we have. Joe has done that really well by going back and showing the other side of the history that we have kind of left out, and that is the Jewish segment that we need to look at, because that had a huge amount of impact on what was happening in the 7th century. Thanks so much for that, Joe. I'm sure some of you will not, will not agree with him. I don't agree with everything he has said. I, we're going to have to. I still believe in the Qibla uh, facing towards Petra. I, I would, that's a, for another argument for another day. That's not important. What is important is, where, who is this man, Umar? Who is he and what did he do and what kind of influence did he have? And did he become a Christian? He first persecuted them, even executed them, was changed by them, and then seems to have come on board with them. And then why was he there in Jerusalem uh, building that structure? Obviously, that structure, that whole Temple Mount has had importance from, well, as we well know, from it the did, time. But it was, it was abandoned. It was abandoned twice, remember? Before before Abdul Malik finished it off, and the, and remember though, Petra is the is the is Nabatia. This is where these Ishmaelite Sadducees came from. So you and know, Petra it's, would be it's, their sanctuary. Now, fascinating. I've 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 heard you. I've, I'm not just you. I've heard other people say that all of these mosques that predate 632, that predate 650, 632, even be earlier than that, that they are nothing more than synagogues that are facing. Yes, we have, we have documentary evidence for that. Yes, you're can, not the yeah. first to say that. And I know that Gibson has been asked about that. And so that's for another talk for another time. That's not important right now. What we are interested in is who and what, how did Islam then come out of this milieu? And it looks like there's a lot more that we need to unpack. I'm it's fascinated that you also agree with Luxembourg and also Luling that there is a Christian element, there is a Christian element to the book that is being put together, and it looks like an awful lot of borrowing that has come there. Yeah, Nothing but it's got to be the monophysite view, because from, you should know this, from Judaism, it's impossible in Judaism to view Jesus as a human Messiah, because the Sanhedrin has to approve him as a human Messiah. 
So the only option in Judaism to, for G viewing Jesus as the Messiah is to view him as this, uh, uh, this messianic soul, this, messianic, this messianic, uh, spirit, which we all know is the Messiah. We all know that the Ruach Elohim is the Messiah. We know that. So you kind of, uh, what's the word? You kind of get around the obstacle of having to have a human Messiah confirmed by the Sanhedrin if you accept him as the spirit Messiah, which is like this monophysite view. So that's a very Jewish solution to uh, a very Jewish problem. You know, <laughs> you've got so so that's why monophysite uh, Christology works. Um, from it a, because from, it fits your paradigm better, than it's easier for you to right. work with. That's great. Now, for those who are watching, comment. Let's see what you let's see what you come up with. Joe, I'm going to ask you that you do look at the comments and that you try, for, as read Judaism, to try to respond as they will. And if we see some real, if we see that where there needs to be some comeback, we're going to do some comeback. And we'll have you come along again and do a... I'll make, vid yeah, I'll make video subsequent. responses. Yeah. We yeah. need to do a subsequent to, uh, to pack, unpack this because we do, want to, we do want to make sure that we get all voices in this uh, voice. And we want to make sure that we give equality to all the different voices. Not everything that you've heard today, you will agree with. A lot of it probably will be the first time you've ever heard it. That's why it's so exciting having people like Joe come on board because we need to have his voice. We need to have his categories up and his background to enlarge what we already know or what we think we're already knowing with what's happening in the seventh century. Listen, it's been great having you, Joe. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, we'll have you back again. And uh, it's great to know that you have been working on this as long as I have, but you're working on it from a totally different perspective than what I have been doing. And uh, that's why it's great to know that we can work together. We may not agree with each other. We don't even come from the same faith, but we no, do, no, that's right. we do we know. We just went in very different directions. It's just interesting that, I mean, your, your, your knowledge uh, is, is so broad and deep on uh, areas, on academic areas. Mine is broad and deep on the Jewish areas. But I mean, they're basically two Absolutely. different worlds, you know, we need two different libraries. We've not really had someone of your ilk or your ability to come on board to help us out with that. So thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure having you. God bless thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank Joe, you. God bless and you too. Until next time, this is Jay and Joe, 3,000 miles apart. And you, here we are on the same, <laughs> the same room almost. Same on, subject. <laughs> on the same subject and coming to somewhat the same conclusions. God bless you all. Until next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>